So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on where you are now. So thank you again to join us for this uh, very interesting cast talk today that will be given by Professor Hussam Amruch from University of Stuttgart in Germany. Today we are here for the uh, talk by Professor Hussam Amruch from University of Stuttgart. So uh, Hussam is a professor heading the chair of semiconductor test and reliability, star within the University of Stuttgart, received a PhD degree with the highest distinction, uh, summa cum laude from uh, KIT in Kausru in 2015. His main research interests are AI processor design, beyond the von Neumann architecture, hardware security, and the emerging technologies. He holds eight high peak paper awards. He has given 10 tutorials in many major EDA conferences, such as DAC and DICICAD, and more than 25 invited talks in many companies and universities. He's a reviewer in many top journals, including Nature Electronics. By the way, now he's a, 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 also an editor of uh, Nature Electronics. So congratulations, uh, Hussam. He has around uh, 106 publications, in, including 64 journals in multidisciplinary research areas across the entire computing stack, starting from semiconductor physics to circuit design all the way up to computer architecture. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Hussam, to accept our invitation. And uh, the floor is with you now. Thanks a lot, uh, Ricardo, for having me here. And uh, again, from my side, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where you are across the globe. And today, I'm going to share with you how we can realize Rayable, brain-inspired computing. So we have lots of excitement about going beyond von human, but the problem is always about how we can ensure the Rayable computing on top of such an emerging novel, let's say immature yet, hardware. So the whole talk is about the journey, moving from beyond CMOS technologies to beyond von human architectures. In a, that journey, we will look about how we can realize a hardware software co-design in a very comprehensive manner in order to achieve rayable yet very ultra efficient, how to say, computing. Talking about the efficiency, we always as engineers, we dream and we hope and we aim at increasing the efficiency of our systems. We always obsessed about the fact or what we think is a fact, increasing the efficiency will give us more and more saving. But is it really true? Is it always more efficiency is always better and more saving? Let's go back to the history. 1865, when Jevons in England, he observed after the invention of the steam engine, which was a very, very, very efficient, the total consumption in England was keep increasing. How could it be when we invent a new technology that increase largely the efficiency, we don't gain saving. Years later, this became known in economy as Jevons paradox. Whenever the technology increases the efficiency of a process, the large increase in the demand behind that process or behind that technology will compensate, if not cancel out most of the obtained saving. And too much efficiency might at the end of the day back fire. There is no doubt for us in the, that the next revolution for humankind is coming from AI. Breakthroughs and the underlying uh, deep learning algorithms increase the efficiency largely in many domains and many of the applications that we would have never dreamed in the past became reality nowadays from autonomous driving to autonomous drones and many other emerging or let's say many other uh, exciting domains. However, if we look to the trends in all AI applications, we see clearly the large increase, a significant increase in the need for more and more computing power. In fact, as the data here suggests that the computing demand for AI algorithms almost doubling every three and a half or 3.4, three and a half months. So 
we need more and more performance. But the problem is that this large increase in the performance could not be achieved by our traditional computing paradigms or our traditional GPU CPUs. This is why specialized hardware accelerators or AI chips became more and more indispensable. The first edition or one of the early editions was from Google TPU, Tensor Processing Unit, around 2016, 2017. And one of the new versions, the version 4, and around beginning of 2020, they showed they are able to train one of the very complex deep learning algorithms known as BERT. They are able to train it with around only one to two minutes, which is equivalent to what we need for more than 2,000 GPUs and 500 CPUs in, in only one TPU. So the large increase in the efficiency will actually motivate us to start to deploy deep learning algorithms and adopt it more and more in our life. The increase in the AI hardware efficiency will drop definitely the cost of deep learning training algorithms. And because the cost becomes less, more and more companies will start to adopt AIs. But where all those AIs will be trained? Always in the cloud, in other words, in the data centers. So therefore, we need more and more data centers. And if we look to some facts about data centers, they are already contributing largely to the carbon footprints and the expectation they will actually, the total footprints that's coming from the carbon, foot, uh, carbon footprint from data centers will exceed in around 23, more than 13% of the total global carbon footprints. AI is coming or is going to reshape the future of humankind, no doubt. But it's now the correct time that we ask ourselves at which cost. Do you know that training one of the complex deep learning algorithms will emit a carbon not only more than the entire lifetime of a vehicle, but more than five of them together, including the carbon footprint that comes during the manufacturing process itself. Environmental damage due to AI is not actually an external force which scientists have no control over. But we have to look deep to the source of the problem and the root of the problems about the inherent efficiency or inefficiency and energy losses that's coming in AI applications. First and foremost, if we look to, as an example for this Google TPU or any, any actually, this is nothing special about the Google TPU, but for any AI chip accelerator, we easily can notice two main components. One is the massive Mac array, the multiply accumulate unit, that's performing a massive number of parallel multiplications, operations at the same time, in order to perform all the required matrices, multiplications that's needed for deep learning algorithms. Whenever you back such a thousand and a huge number of multiplications, which are very power hungry in a very small area, then no doubt that the power density will be very high. And as a consequence of that, the temperature and thermal hotspots will emerge quickly. And as a result, we need an expensive cooling in order to keep the chip in an operational, safe operational conditions. This is why all AI chips, and especially the Google TPUs and others, they have a large cost in the cooling. And they go even to special cooling solutions, as we will see later. On the other side, we can see also and observe easily the large on-chip memory that's here in this example occupies around 30% of the total area footprint. However, you can notice easily this is only 24 megabyte. Is that sufficient? In fact, if you look to the complex deep learning algorithms nowadays, they talk about an area requirement easily above the 100 megabytes, and sometimes they can even go to gigabytes. In fact, complex, very complex deep learning algorithms such as AlphaGo, they can go even to something like 175 billions of parameters that needs to be tuned. And you can easily imagine the huge amount of memory requirement. Now, the problem is, if we have such a very huge intensive applications that needs this huge amount of memory requirement, and at the same time, we have only in our chip very small available on-chip memory, such as in this example, 24 megabyte, of course, there is a massive amount of data that needs to be transferred back and forth, back and forth between the computing engine, in this example, the Mac array, and the off-chip memory, the DRAM, and even the hard disk where the 
where the memory or where the data is available. And this will put us in front of the very well-known problem as a but, uh, von Neumann bottleneck and the memory wall. The separation between the computing engine and the memory will create for us now this bottleneck. And this bottleneck even becomes more and more worse once we have such applications like AI applications where they are extremely hungry for data. And both of those two sides, in my opinion, the expensive cooling, which coming as a result from the huge on-chip uh, power density, as well as on-chip temperatures, as well as the large energy that's spent in moving the data, just moving the data back and forth between the chip and the off-chip memory, this together, of course, will contribute to the massive energy cost. But we could actually ask ourselves even a much deeper question. What is really the root of all those problems? If we look to the technology nowadays, we can trace back most of those problems to probably three walls, in my opinion. So we start from the voltage wall. We always hear about voltages not scaling well, and then our scaling stopped more than 15 years ago. But probably we should actually remember or, or, or not forget how far we are in the voltage scaling. Is it like we just don't want to scale the voltage, or we are reaching a fundamental limit in voltage scaling? We will see soon about that the voltage in the current technology is reaching fundamental limits. That's coming deeply from the fundamental semiconductor physics. Then we just talked about the memory. The memory is not sufficient for on-chip memory, yet it consumes 30% of the chip. And on top of that, these memories coming from traditional SRAM, they are very area and power hungry. To store a single bit, you need around six transistors that you need to keep them on the whole time. So this is an inherent inefficiency in the current memory technology. It's insufficient for AI applications. And on top of that, this is a volatile memory that needs to be powered on the whole time, which means lots of efficiencies losses. Finally, cooling. And in my opinion, cooling is something we always forget it. And we just assume we have enough cooling or we can really go to as much as cooling we would like. But in fact, when you go to those chips designs, like, like those AI chips, where you have this massive amount of computations that's happening in only one corner and generating those too much power densities and then temperatures, traditional cooling start to also, traditional coolings, which is like a heat sink and a fan, start also to reach its fundamental limit, as we'll see very soon. So those are the three walls that facing the technologies and putting us in front of the indispensable and inevitable need to invent new architectures that go beyond the traditional von Neumann principles and couple that with the new emerging technologies that go beyond the fundamental principles of CMOS that we used to use for decades. And here I would borrow what David Peterson said in many of his recent keynotes. Performance, actually, it's almost at the end of the line. So if we look to this data and this figure, can tell us nicely how the, how, how the performance that we expect with every new generation from our computing system is slowing down. And in fact, now we are almost uh, at the end of the line because and to get what we used to get like a double of the performance in the 1980s, now it needs almost like 20 years to achieve that. This is a combination between the not scaling, the stop, between MDES law and between many other problems that's happening the technology was remembering that the voltage is not scaling down and variability reliability is all together puts lots of constraints and obstacles for the performance and we see that the technology is not able to deliver us the performance as intended but at the same time we have this exposure in the law and the need for more and more performance for ai applications is there any hope of course yes but interdisciplinary is the key we cannot find a single solution, but it must be multiple solutions that we can couple them together in order to solve those multi problems that we are facing in the technology. We should start from the underlying technology and we look for beyond CMOS technologies that can break the fundamental limits in voltage scaling. On top of that, we should look, of course, for emerging memories that can replace this traditional SRAM memory in a way that it can be 
how to say, uh, provide us with much larger capacity, but also with energy saving. On top of that, an emerging beyond CMOS technology together with emerging memories will allow us actually to build the novel AR architectures. So we should not keep using our traditional phone numeric architecture. And here we should try to invent and move more to something like a beyond phone numeric architectures where we bring both memory and computing together for the very well-known paradigms in compute in memory. However, a smart and novel AI architecture would not really work without a novel AI algorithm on top of it. So probably is a time also that we think about how we can replace all those deep learning algorithms, they are inherently extremely data hungry. Finally, maybe we should think about how we can replace our traditional cooling that consists of either a heat sink with a fan or probably, or maybe a water cooling, a liquid cooling, maybe how we can replace it with something more, much more efficient that we are able to cool down our chip where it's needed and only when it's needed. So in the next few slides, I will take you with a journey starting from beyond CMOS to emerging memories, to novel AI architectures, to novel AI algorithms, all the way even to the system level, talking about emerging cooling. Let's start with our journey with moving to the beyond CMOS technology. And beyond CMOS technology, I will pick up one of the very promising technologies nowadays, which is the negative capacitance transistor. We all know that in semiconductor physics, there is a fundamental limit in the speed or in the way how we can switch the transistor between off and on state. This is well attributed to the so-called sub-threshold swing. And if we could build a transistor that they have or they feature much steeper slope, then we would be able to achieve the same on current, hence the same performance, but at much, much lower voltage. You see here in this cartoon example that we, are, we could actually achieve the same performance, same on current, but at 0 0.2 instead of 1.2 volt. Of course, that will give us an amazing saving in power. But why we cannot build such a very steep transistors? Well, this is well known in physics as a fundamental limit of the subthreshold swing which is coming simply from the fact that two capacitance in series, there's always a voltage drop in the middle point, I would say, in between. And with going to some math and a little bit from the uh, basics in the semiconductor physics, this can be calculated to be theoretically that the minimum would be 60 millivolt per decade. And this comes from this simple math here, if you take a look, it's, you have the subthreshold swing, it's a lambda, which is the body factor, multiplied by 60 millivolt, but then that lambda, which is coming from two capacitance in series, it's actually one plus a positive number. So therefore, this lambda body factor is always larger than one. As a result, the sub-threshold swing, it must be always larger than 60 millivolt per decade. Even if we want to go to the absolute theoretical limit 60 millivolt per decade, this means we have to make lambda to be one, which means you have to get the capacitance to be, I don't know, let's say zero in this case. The the, 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 uh, or maybe infinity, the insulator, to become in order to get lambda 1. But let's take a look where we stand at this point of time in technology. TSMC and 7 nanometer technology, they already announced a few years ago, they are achieving the 65 millivolt per decade. So if the 60 millivolt per decade is the absolute theoretical limit, so we already know, know that we are almost reaching that fundamental limit and the technology at this point of time it's so close to that fundamental limit. So therefore, even in the advanced technologies and even moving to three or two nanometer, there is no room for the improvement and the room for improvements getting smaller and smaller. Hence, and this is why, as a matter of fact, we have to figure out a way in order that we break that fundamental limit. Is there any hope or is there any way? It turns out, actually, we can suppress that fundamental limit if we make that that the factor, the body factor lambda, is smaller than one. But how we can make that? We should make the other term negative because then we get one minus negative value. But how we can make a negative capacitance? Do we have anything in nature as a negative capacitance? And this is the very exciting, actually, topic 
because it turns out that replacing the traditional high K material that's used to be used in the or advanced or old technology, let's say at least since 2008, replacing the traditional high K material with a ferroelectric material, the so-called negative capacitance effect can be realized. And the negative capacitance effect and the ferroelectricity in the half in your material has been also realized commercially uh, or, or not commercial, let's say in 2012, they have been uh, figured out how they can realize the having the, the ferroelectricity effects in the traditional hafenium uh, material. So therefore, by doping the high-K material with zirconium, we are able to transfer the high-K, traditional high-K, to ferroelectric layer or ferroelectric material, which exhibit under certain conditions of capacitance matching the so-called negative capacitance effect. As a result of such an effect, remember you have two capacitance in series. Typically, the point in the middle from the high school physics must be, you know, the voltage drop must have exhibit a voltage drop. But now, since the upper capacitor, which is the insulator, since now it's negative, we get a voltage amplification. As a result of that voltage amplification, we are able actually to achieve higher current for the same voltage but also, more importantly, at achieving the same current, but at a lower voltage. And this is the big promise of NCFET. But in order to uncover the full potential of the NCFET, it's not enough that we look to the data that's coming from the underlying transistors. Because as expected in any emerging technology or in anything in life, there is no free lunch. If the technology is offering us such an amazing increase in the on current without increasing the voltage due to the negative capacitance effect, there's also some other side effects. And one of the side effects that coming is the increase in the total capacitance. Because two capacitance in series in the traditional, how to say, uh, ordinary capacitance, we get a total capacitance to be smaller than each of them. But if one of those capacitances becomes negative, the total capacitance of the system becomes larger. And this has a big implications because the performance of any circuit, it's not only about the higher current, but also the capacitance that would be charged. And other stuff like dynamic power, voltage drops, and many important aspects in any circuit design must take into account the gain in the current as well as the side effects from the increase in the total capacitance. In order to explore that, we cannot only look at the data that's coming from the single transistor. We have to press the gap from the underlying semiconductor physics all the way up to the entire system. And this gap is large because we have to start from the underlying physics equation that describes such phenomenon and then integrate them within the standard uh, industrial compact model, and then build libraries. And once we have the libraries, we are able to plug them within any traditional EDA tool flows. You can do then synthesis, you can do power analysis, a timing analysis, a sign off, and complete chip design. And this is what have been working on in the last few years with collaborations with other research partners, that how we can take the underlying physics equations or physics-based equation that describes the negative capacitance effect and then integrated within the industrial, the industry standard compact model, the BSM CMG for the FinFET technology, and then characterize the entire standard cell library under the effects of negative capacitance, and then take those libraries, they are fully compatible with any existing EDA tool flows, like say cadence or synopsis or whatever, and then we plug them and we do the complete chip design for processors in order to answer that ultimate question, how much performance I would gain, how much dynamic power I would lose, or what are the trade-offs between uh, that this new technology that would offer to us. We have done recently this work or this exploration for again, for mimicking as much as possible the Google TPU chip. And by looking to the data, by analyzing how to say the MAC array after the synthesis and after the, uh, the power and performance analysis, and we have done that for different uh, precisions, as you see here from the x-axis, the MAC precision, 
It turned out that the power saving for an ISO performance, it's around 50%. So what that really means, it means because the negative capacitance will allow us to go to lower voltage without a loss in the on current, hence without a loss in the performance, so we can still sustain the original baseline frequency, we are able to save around, let's say, 40 to 50%, which is, of course, amazing because the power saving in the MAC unit or the MAC array will be translated directly to 50% saving in the power density, which will be translated directly to lots of saving in the temperature and hence cooling cost. And this is what you could imagine. If this technology becomes reality, and if we are able to really replace the transistors that used to build, how to say, our logic in the traditional or in the Mac arrays, we are able to achieve such a 40 to 50% saving in the power without a loss on the performance, which will be translated directly to lots of saving in the total energy and the total cost for cooling. Let's now continue our journey and move towards the emerging memories. And here I will focus on an, another example, which is a ferroelectric transistor. You might be here confused. You say, okay, you already talked about a ferroelectric layer within a negative capacitance transistor. And now out of sudden you talk about emerging memory, which use the same word, the ferroelectric. You should not be confused because that is totally correct. When a bump turns into feature, if we increase the thickness of the ferroelectric layer after or above a certain limit, let's say five nanometers, six, all the way up to 10, the so-called hysteresis effect start to appear because the dipoles within the ferroelectric layer start to be polarized. And this, if you apply a negative or positive voltage or electric field, this will polarize the dipoles either up or down. And this polarization remains even after removing the electric field because the magnetic effect, and therefore we are able to store this. But what that really means in practice, it means we are able to change the electrical characteristic of the transistor into two different separated states, a low VT state and a high VT state. A low current, oh, sorry, a high current and a low current. Why? Because when the ferroelectric layer is polarized either up or down, it will now start to interfere when we apply our voltage and our electric field to turn on or off the transistor. And either it will start to help and enhance the channel formation. Therefore, we will get a reduction in the threshold voltage represented here in the blue curve, or it will actually oppose the channel formation and make it more difficult to turn on the transistor, which in a sense, it's a high VT state because we need a much higher voltage to turn on the transistor. And this represented in this figure with the red curve. Again, in a summary, if you increase the thickness and exaggerate in the thickness of your ferroelectric layer, something like a 10 nanometer, you would be able to separate the, the two states or create two different states in the transistor, a low VT state and a high VT state with enough distance, separation between them. And we call that like a memory window. And then if you think, if you look at this figure easily and think about applying a voltage of around 0.5 volt, then you can sense a current. This current either would be something like a 10 to the minus 5 ampere, which is quite high, like a 0 0.01 milliampere, or you will sense something like a very small and a smaller than a picoampere. So based on what you have stored in your transistor, you would apply a voltage and you sense the provided current. And if the current is very high or very small, you would be able to differentiate between two different states, logic one or logic zero. And this, of course, a realization of a memory. And more interestingly, this memory is a non-volatile memory because it's a remnant polarization. The polarization will remain after removing the electric field. Let's imagine together 
if this technology becomes reality. And there's lots of demonstration from global foundries here in Germany, also from Intel recently. So many companies, also TSMC, are inv investing a lot in this technology. The promise is clear. Again, it's a compatibility with CMOS because the realization of the ferroelectricity in hafenium is possible through the zirconium doping. On top of that, replacing our six transistor SRAM with a single transistor to create a memory is indeed extremely attractive and amazing. Increasing the capacity will allow us to store more and more data without the need to communicate to the off-chip memory. And finally, this is ultra dense. And on top of that, this is non-volatile memory. Therefore, you can really turn it off and save lots of power instead of the SRAM that keep leaking the whole time. Let's imagine together the scenario that if technology becomes reality and we go and we replace our traditional on-chip memory with a ferroelectric memory, we will easily increase the capacity. And if you increase the capacity, it will be translated directly to less and less lesser communications with the off-chip memory, with the DRAM, which largely contribute to the mitigating the so-called von Neumann bottleneck. Therefore, more and more energy saving can be obtained. Now, the beauty of this ferroelectric technology, as you see, in theory, you would be able to realize in a steep slope transistor with NC fit when the thickness of the ferroelectric is very thin, let's say around two to three nanometer. In fact, there was even a breakthrough, really breakthrough, just very recently, two weeks ago, a paper coming from Saif Salahuddin from Berkeley that published in Science, and they showed for the first time that the ferroelectricity can be realized even at the thickness of a 0.5 nanometer. This is indeed a breakthrough because it has been thought for a long time that it's impossible from physics perspective to have a ferroelectricity effect under a certain thickness when the layer becomes very, very, very thin. It has been thought or believed for decades that the ferroelectricity cannot be realized. However, very recently, as I said, they showed that the thickness of a 0.5, which is like, like a 2D uh, layer, always like, a, I don't know, two sheets or whatever from atoms, they are able or they still be able to realize the ferroelectricity, which is indeed a big, big, big uh, breakthrough. So imagining that this ferroelectricity will allow us to have a steep slope transistor, and therefore, we are able to achieve the same performance, but much lower power. This will solve lots of our power density, temperature problems, and in fact, reviving the Denard scaling that has been stopped for more than a decade. On top of that, if this is the same technology, and this is only we just need that we increase the thickness, and we would be magically realize a, uh, a non-volatile memory in NVM, therefore, we can also increase largely the memory capacity, which will contribute largely to the von Neumann bottleneck, and we get lots of additional, lots of energy saving. So this is why this technology is so promising, because it actually can solve for us two of the fundamental problems that we are facing nowadays. As expected for any emerging technology, reliability is the key challenge. Because the material is immature, and you are moving from very well-known studied CMOS to something else. On top of that, you have a new additional layer, which comes with an own a new problems. The famous reliability challenges are coming, of course, from variability. Design time variability coming from the variation in the underlying physical parameters, such as the thickness of the ferroelectric layer, the remnant polarization, the corrosive field, as well as the traditional Manufacturing variability sources like Doben fluctuation, random, random Doben fluctuations, the surface roughness, and all other work function fluctuations, and all variability sources that they are extremely dominant in the deep uh, nanotechnologies, small uh, nanotechnologies, on, together with the additional variability that's coming from the ferroelectricity, of course, we get lots of problems in the design time. But we should not forget Runtime variability coming from temperature is another big and key source of fluctuations that imposes additional reliability challenges. Then how we can survive, how we can make 
the best use of this technology knowing it's so noisy how to say. Before explaining that, let me add on top of it an additional extremely challenging and not studied in detail source of variability. It's coming from the inherent stochasticity in the material. As expected, you have a new material that you are growing by doping the zirconium in the hafenium, and this new material will have diff or this doping will create now the ferroelectricity, and you have different grains. Those grains they have different sizes, different shape, and as a result, they will interact with the channel in a very different way. So this is a stochasticity that imposes an additional source of variability that is very difficult to live with. In fact, the first step is you need to model it. And to model that, you really need to go to the extreme, how to say, uh, low level, which is at the fundamental atomic level or at the fundamental material level, where you can replace or mimic what the ferroelectricity doing by charges and then do the expensive, very expensive Monte Carlo simulations at the material layer, material level, in order to see how the transistor would be impacted when or due to the stoch inherent stochasticity in the ferroelectric. And if you are interested in this, in, based on your background, we had recently a paper in the International Electron Device Meeting, IDM, where we showed for the first time how such stochasticity can be modeled and studied in the ferroelectric uh, transistors. Once we are able to model the variability, doesn't matter if it's coming from design time, from runtime, inherent stochasticity. Once we are able to develop those models, then we know how to live with it because we can go to our traditional deep learning algorithms and we can train them in the presence of those errors. And this is actually the key. The key is emerging technology will suffer from variability, will suffer from lots of immaturity, will suffer from problems. Making them mature and exhibit no variability, I think it's very, very, very difficult and maybe it takes decades to be achieved. However, the key is two things. First and foremost, you have to model this variability. You have to be able to translate the inherent variability in the material and the underlying technology into abstracted probability of errors without a loss. Of, of course, you are abstracting, but as accurate as possible with the validation, with the experiments, of course. And then, once you have those accurate probability of error models, you can actually inject them during the training of your deep learning algorithms, and we can do the so-called error-aware training, which will allow us to obtain deep learning models that inherently robust against the underlying errors that's coming from the technology. As an example here, we have done the work for the binary neural network. And if you are not familiar with the binary neural network, it's one of the very attractive and promising domains in deep learning where they are able to train the neural network using a binary single bit representation for the weights and the activation. Therefore, the binary neural network is very attractive when it comes to the energy saving because the area require, sorry, the memory requirement is small because you only need one bit to represent your, you represent your parameters instead of either uh, eight bits like an integer or probably even a 32 bit floating point, which are very expensive. So binary neural networks are promising due to the light representation of the parameters. And on top of that, you don't need in a binary neural network expensive multipliers and MAC units. In fact, you can do the operations using a very simple XNOR logic. So binary neural network is very promising. And actually, it has a very nice uh, synergy with the emerging technology because the representation of a single, how to say, uh, bit, this means now one single transistor, one single ferroelectric uh, memory, you are able actually to store your weights and activation in a very efficient manner. We have done this work and we modeled from the deep semiconductor physics, the inherent variability that's coming from the stochasticity, from temperature, as well as from uh, process variation. We abstracted all those to accurate probability of error models. And then we have trained the binary neural networks in order to be robust against those errors. And we can see here from those two figures for two different data sets, Fashion and Cypher 10, how the 
the, the green curve, which is the error-aware training, is able to sustain the baseline accuracy without a loss, although the temperature increases from, let's say, a room temperature or zero temperature or zero degree all the way up to 80 degree, while when the other side, the models that they are unaware of the temperature effect, they drop significantly. So the key, again, is not the magic. It's very well known. We all know that hardware, software, co-design. Get the probability of error as accurate as possible for the emerging technology, which is not easy, but once you have it, you can do a lot. And the first thing you can do is to train your deep learning algorithms to learn how to live with those errors. Similar concepts can be applied also for the spiking uh, in neuron, uh, neuron networks, where are lots of attractions there because, again, they are extremely lightweight or extremely promising for the energy saving. And they borrow lots of concepts from the human brain's uh, computations, how to say, and they, 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 they are very good for the neuromorphic hardware. But the problem with this, those type of spiking neuron networks is, again, whenever you want to do it for an emerging technology like the Ferro, they are, again, very sensitive for the errors that's coming from the underlying technology. We applied the same concept without going into details. And the uh, interesting part that it turns out if you train your binary neural network under errors, so you get now an error-aware binary neural network model, and you take that model, which is binary neural network, has nothing to do with the spiking neural network, but then you map those weights and those parameters to the spiking domain, then actually you will get the uh, how to say, uh, the robustness, or you will transfer the robustness that you obtained in the binary neural network, you will transfer it to the spiking neural networks. So this was a nice link between two different domains, a binary neural networks that has nothing to do with the spiking neural networks, but spiking neural networks is very difficult to train into errors, but binary neural networks is easy to be trained. Hence, we just take our uh, robust binary neural networks models that has been trained with errors, and then we just map them to the spiking domain, and then we get a very robust spiking neural networks. Let's move one step farther and now see how we can use and exploit this ferroelectric transistor, but now in, in memory computings. We just explained this ferroelectric device, and we said that it can separate the transistor into two different states. High VT and the low VT, high current and the low current. Now, I want to just to imagine a little bit, if you take two of those ferroelectric transistors and combine them, you can form a cell. And this cell, whenever you want to store information, we will store it in a complementary manner. So if we store zero, let's say the transistor from the left side will be in the low VT state, a blue, and the transistor from the right side will be in the high VT state, Right. So whenever you store information, either 0 or 1, you will put it in a complementary manner. Easy. Now, the promise is, or the interesting part, that if you want now to search, if you apply a certain voltage, let's say 1, or high volt, 1 volt, then the, on the transistor, which is blue, the low VT transistor, will turn on. And therefore, you have a discharging current. And on the other side, if you apply 0, both transistor will remain off. What that really means, it means we are able to sense and know the content of the memory without reading the memory. It's the realization of the CAM, the content addressable memory. And in a practice, if you have a mismatch, you will get a discharge current. And if you have a match, you will get no discharge current. So let's repeat it. If you have a mismatch, 1, 0, or 0, 1, you will get discharge, which is 0. And if you have a match, which is 1, 1, or 0, 0, you will get actually no discharge, hence the current or the voltage remains high. This is actually an XNOR operation. Because the XNOR will give you 1 only when you have two ones or two zeros. So when you have a match. So now we can see. With two transistors from Ferro, we can go and realize a very compact logic in memory, a very compact XNOR that's able to do the XNOR operation between stored value and the upcoming or coming value without any read operation. 
And that's actually the first step to break the fundamental von Neumann bottleneck, the separation between the memory and the computing. So if we merge now the XNOR operation with the memory together, this has a far reaching consequences as we will see soon. We can sense the current in practice and based on the current, if we see if it's no drop or no discharge or there's a discharge, we are able actually easily to differentiate if this was zero or one. Let's take now the same concept of this uh, TCAM or CAM and let's put more of those cells. Let's build an array. And once you have an array, let's store a vector. Let's say one, one, zero. And now let's apply another vector, say one, zero, one. What will happen, you will get now, some of those cells will have a match and some of them will have a mismatch. Hence, you will have a current or no current. As a result, and remember the Kirchhoff's law, you have now all those currents, though they will be accumulated, there will be some of those current, and then you can sense the current, and then you can interpret the current. The current, based how much, how large the current, you would be able to know if you have how many mismatches occur. In other words, you will be able to calculate the Hamming distance. This is also very promising because we know that Hamming distance means calculating the similarities. And calculating the similarities is one of the cornerstones in many machine learning algorithms because this is how you can do the classification properly. In other words, you are able here to store data and then bring new data in a very, very efficient manner you would be able to calculate the similarity between the stored data and the upcoming data without even touching the memory, without reading your content. And this actually opens doors for a novel AI algorithms, brain-inspired hyperdimensional computing. This is one of the very exciting, in my opinion, paradigms that known since long time, but start very recently in fact, in the last four, five, six years, that gets lots of attractions. And the reason is the ability to do classifications in much, much lighter way compared to the deep learning algorithms. But the promise is coming from the ability to learn much, much, much faster. How this learning works? Is it complex? Well, let's see. I will try to explain it in one, two minutes, and I hope that you will understand it. And this will convince you how simple those algorithms yet very efficient. Let's take a problem like language classification. And if you want to classify a text that you don't know belongs to which language, you have to train at the very beginning your model to learn different languages, English, French, and German language, etc. Now, I will take an example about this language classification and show you this how such an algorithm would work. For every character in your language, A, B, C, and all the special characters, we will assign a, 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 a random vector that's a very large, let's say 10,000 bits of random vectors. Because this is a very large vector, the chance and the probability you get two similar vectors for two different items is very, very, very small. Now, you have for your characters an assigned vector that represents that character, which consists of a very huge number of bits, let's say 10,000 in this example. Then we get a text, and this text we want to encode it, but the encoding algorithm is very simple. It just takes n n-gram, let's say three characters, and then you do simple operations, just XNOR and rotate without going into too much details, but it relies on two simple operations, XNOR and rotate, and then you will start to encode the text that you have. Let's take an example. You have a text like to be or not to be that you want to train. And then what you have here, you read the first three characters, the n gram, and you will get the three different, how to say, uh, random vectors. And then you will apply the simple algorithm of rotate and XNOR, and you get a new vector. And you keep moving until your text finish. What do you get? You get many of those new vectors. Then you just apply a simple, you count the number of ones and you apply simple majority vote. Now you are able to translate all those vectors to into single vector. That simple vector, the hyper vector, hyper vector, 
represent at this moment the entire language because this vector it embed how different texts and different characters will come together to form the English language in this example. We can repeat this same algorithm, which is very simple as you see, and you just can provide it with any textbook and then quickly can learn it. We can repeat it for different languages, French, Italian, etc. And then you get a new vector that's coming from a new text that you have no idea about, you don't know its which language, and you want to classify it very quickly. First, you take all those vectors and you assign them to the memory array that I have just explained, where you have all those in-memory Hamming distance calculations. You store those classes, English, French, Italian, you store your classes and you bring the new vector and now you do on-the-fly Hamming distance calculations, a very efficient analog manner. You put it, currents will come from every row and you send the current and the vector that represent or the, the row or the item that gives you the best match that will be your best class you sense the current for instance in this example and you can translate that to the corresponding hemming distance and the row or the item that gives you the smallest hemming distance that would be of course the best match now you can get a taste and feeling how efficient this technology because now you are able to actually do all those Hamming distance calculations on the fly. We should remember that beyond CMOS technology plus beyond von Neumann, hardware errors will be inevitable. You always you will get errors. So therefore, there is no doubt that we really need to build the robust AI algorithms that are able to survive with these errors. And the hyperdimensional computing is a very promising because remember, it relies on a huge random input data or randomness in the data. You talk about thousands of random bits. And because the data is represented in such a very large, massive number of dimensions, even a bit flip or 10 or even 100 would not cause you a big problem. So therefore, any noise and fluctuations and problems and variabilities coming from the underlying technology, the hyperdimensional computing will know how to live with it. Let's move to the last point in our journey, and I will talk very briefly about it, intelligent cooling. Let's borrow and let's read together what the Google CEO announced in around 2020 when they had that new version of Google TPUs. So I will borrow his words and say, he said, these chips are so powerful that for the first time, we had to introduce liquid cooling in our data centers. This shows that the massive power densities and temperature that's coming from those chips, they impose a serious challenge for the traditional air-based cooling. And if you think about it, that's true. You look to the chip and you are cooling down the entire chip, despite the fact that the hotspot is so localized on only one area, which is where the Mac unit and the Mac engine doing all the massive computations. The memory and the other parts relatively very cold or much, much cooler. So the hotspot is so localized. This is why emerging cooling solutions that's coming from the super lattice thermoelectric is very promising. Those type of solutions, they are allow you to embed a thermoelectric device, which is an ultra thin, few micrometers within the chip die itself and hence generate through the Peltier effect, a cooling, very actually very, uh, effective cooling effects. So you put the thermoelectric device on top of your hotspot. The thermoelectric device employs the well-known Peltier effect. And the Peltier effect will make one side of the thermoelectric very cold, which is where you want to cool down the chip, and one side very hot, but it will be dissipated through the packaging and the heatsink. We have done extensive work on studying the impact of the thermoelectric devices using a complex multiphysics simulations from ANSYS, and it turns out you are able to really suppress a hotspot that's coming from around 200 watt per square centimeter, which is a very large power density, as we know, leading in this example to around 125 degree. We are able to suppress it all the way down to around 108 degree, which is very, very, very promising. Temperature is the unseen enemy. And as it has been said, the unseen enemy 
is always the most fearsome. Why? Because once it's here, it's too late. There is nowhere in the there nowhere in technology is that more true than processors. How we can really see the temperature underlying the heatsink? How we can really understand the temperature and the emerging hotspots under the heatsink and the packaging? Once the temperature and the hotspot is emerged, then it's too late. How we can see what's underneath the heatsink? To solve this problem, we have built one of the unique thermal setups that allow the thermal, uh, the infrared camera to capture the AR radiation from the chip without any layer in between, without any interference, without any liquid that can interfere between the, the camera lens and the IR radiation that's coming from the silicon die. We achieve that through applying concepts of uh, Beltier effect and thermoelectric effect on the bottom side of the chip, in, wh in, in which we are dissipating the heat that's coming from the processor through the bottom side or through the BCB instead of the top side as done traditionally. And this again allows for the first time to capture very accurate thermal image for processors without having any layer to interfere and without any package and without any interference between the thermo, between the, uh, the infrared camera and the underlying chip under measurements. This brings me to the end. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the great team. Everything I have presented, all the credit goes to the uh, research team and the PhD student. Without their great work, I would not be able to present any of the works today. They are coming from uh, different backgrounds, some of them from physics, from circuit, from AI hardware, software. This is what allows us to really bridge the gap between material science all the way to system level and computer science. Of course, on top of that, I'm very grateful for the large international network of uh, collaborators from IIT Kanpur, UC Berkeley, New York University, and many others. Without the intensive and very close collaborations with them, most of what I have presented today would never be possible. And last but not least, of course, I would like to acknowledge and thanks the funding agencies from the ONR Office of Novell to the DFG here, the National Funding Agencies, and Adventist, which is one of the big international companies in semiconductor tests, which are investing and funding us a lot here in the University of Stuttgart through the uh, graduate school here, where we are able to study those advanced technologies in a very, very comprehensive manner in order to re reveal problems that are coming from the deep uh, semiconductor or advanced technologies. This brings me to the end. We are, I believe, on the brink of a new era of computing. However, the interdisciplinarity is really the key. We should figure out how we bridge the gap between the beyond CMOS and beyond von Neumann in order to realize an ultra-efficient AI algorithms that can reduce the carbon footprints that's coming from those emerging and amazing domains. This brings me to the end. And thank you very much. And I hope you have enjoyed our journey today from beyond CMOS all the way up to beyond von Neumann. So thank you very much for your very nice and interesting talk, Yusam. Thanks. So now it's time for questions. So uh, who has questions, please uh, do it as soon as possible using the chat channel. So I see no questions yet for the moment. So uh, please do as soon as possible. Uh, so one, uh, I have one question is that... Um, one thing we can see nowadays is that uh, the, the systems and circuits that uh, are implemented by majority of people are still using much more transistor than is needed. No, Correct. so uh, optimization I say that is a keyword in nano CMOS. So, uh, can you comment about this and um, how is the role of uh, optimization in also in emergent technologies? No? That is indeed an excellent uh, point, because with the more advanced technologies, and if we really move really to five nanometer, three nanometer, even before talking about the emerging technologies, 
the cost of those advanced technologies is very, very high. But the gain, actually, is not that high. It becomes always questionable how we can maximize our gain, knowing that the technology is struggling, the voltage is not scaling, the feature size is reaching atomic level. We talk about really three and four, five nanometers. So therefore, technology itself is struggling to provide the promise from the, to justify the cost of the scaling. So therefore, the optimization start now become a key and a big player and a major player. The optimization now will start to bring an additional dimension to gain more and more efficiency for that advanced technology. So this is why even if you look to the synopsis and all those traditional big uh, players or industry in the EDA, nowadays they are bringing lots of machine learning algorithms for traditional problems like uh, logic synthesis, like uh, even a power estimation sign-offs and all those uh, hardcore, how to say, EDAs, even including the uh, physical design. And this is a large area probably you heard and many heard about that the machine learning for CAD. So the need for that, actually, we should remember that the need for that is coming to get a better and better optimizations. And why we need better and better optimizations? Because with the more advanced technology nodes, that more difficult that we start to harvest more and more gain from our technologies. Now, on top of that, when it comes to the emerging technology, it becomes even more and more difficult because now the optimizations plays even a bigger role. Let's just remember we talked in this uh, context about the ferroelectric and the thickness. It could be one, could be two, it could be 10 nanometer. This is a new additional design space and then additional parameters that needs to be also explored. And this is the job again of whom? Of the optimization algorithms. So therefore optimization algorithms, as we all know, is a corner store to gain more and more performance. And actually the role of those optimizations to reduce area footprint, to reduce energy, to reduce power, to figure out an optimal, I would say configurations, it becomes even more and more essential because the cost in advanced technologies and the cost of emerging technologies is so large that we need to figure out how to maximize our gain in order to justify the scaling. Okay, so I'm seeing no questions yet in the channel. So uh, please, if you have a question, you, you, you must do now because uh, if not, you are going to lose the opportunity. We have just here some comments uh, about uh, how nice was your talk. So one is from an India Sundar Dharm from India Institute of Technology, Karagpur. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Amrush, for a very enlightening talk. Thanks. Uh, we have also some other uh, comments about your nice talk from Thiago Weber and Rodrigo Verding. But... Uh, no questions. Uh, so, uh, if there is no questions, I would like to thank you very much for your very nice, interesting talk. Thanks a lot, and, Ricardo. Uh,